know, it's, it's interesting that you said that because here we are talking about Thanksgiving Day. And actually, the first Thanksgiving Day was declared by Abraham Lincoln. You know, and Abraham Lincoln, he had more failures than he ever had successes. You know, and it, it, thinks, it makes me think of another scripture. It says, a righteous man may fall seven times, but he rises again. You know, and Abraham Lincoln had many failures. He, he lost a, something that he loved dearly. He ran, he lost many elections before he ever became president over a 20 year period of time. What is it that keeps you getting your fight back up again when you get knocked down? And, and not just in, not just on the football field, but in life in general. It's the, the same thing. The, the, the fundamental attitude that I have even now, it comes from the, the, the thought of the football game. I mean, life is a football game. And I try to tell young people, when you get knocked down, I don't care what, I don't care if it's in math, your classroom, your English class, business, and whatever. I, I remember that really where I stole this foundational thought process in my head is I was at the Coliseum in 1990, and it was this kid that approached me. It was not a kid, he was young, he was about well, 30 years old. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's a kid to me. But anyway, he, he says, Mr. Davis, you know, I just want to let you know, you talked to me 10 years ago, and you told me if you can, if I can do if anything you want to do in life, you can do it. I said, he said, I was on the verge of dropping out of high school, and you told me to stay in school, work hard, whatever option you want, you can make it. He said, I just want to let you know I grew up, and uh, I had a guidance, and uh, I became the CEO of my own company. Wow. He says, if I don't talk to you, and you were my football idol, he said, if I don't talk to you, that doesn't happen. I said, I didn't want to take the credit, but he says, I just want to let you know you did a lot for me in my life. So that just, just maintains my thought process of that. That is very important. And that's what I tell you. Yeah, that's awesome. And I know you have such a heart for you. You have such a passion for you. And your motivational speaker that you get today. And you've got so many people that put you up on a pedestal and go to you. But where does Anthony Davis go? Where do you go? Where do you get your strength from? Well, I mean, you know, we're all humans and, and we get down and out. Sometimes I pick up a book. Sometimes I talk to people that are close to me, and that's how that's how I re, uh, re-energize my battery. I mean, that's what that's how I do it. And but I always remember I have a, I have a foundation that I established as an athlete. And I always fall back on the hard work as an athlete. And I mean, you know, a lot of people say, you know, oh God, I worked hard to gain the office. I don't know where I don't know what hard work is if I'm not on the football field getting knocked around. You know, I guess it's a lot of mental stress and everything you deal with. But I, I've learned to manage it. But my whole thing is, I'm just glad I wake up every day because I went through some things physically. But uh, I'm just happy I wake up every day. You said that you went through some things physically. Talk to us a little bit about that. It sounds like that was one of those fights in your life. Well, it was a major fight. I don't think I'd be standing here now. I was, uh, I was obese. I was, uh, I had high blood pressure. I was a diabetic. I had sleep apnea. And uh, the doctor told me if I didn't get the procedure. I wouldn't have long to live because it, my weight blew up to 310 pounds, and, uh, and uh, they didn't think I was going to be around. And if, it, if you don't get this done, it's not going to happen. Your life will be short. And I went on through the procedure, and uh, I lost 120 pounds in the last five years. So, as what you see now uh, is my professional playing weight right now. You look great. I said, as of when I saw you today, you need to get back on the field again. No, no. My, <laughs> my mind says I can do it, but my body says no. So that's one of the things, because when I look at a football game, I say, why did the guy run this way? He could have ran this way. And what does that coach think about? I need to be out there. Or I need to be coaching. But, uh, you know, uh, no, my body says no. Brain says yes, body says no. Now, you were the first ever collegiate and, and professional athlete that was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And I see you got the little Nike swoosh sign. And I know that you were the first athlete to ever wear them on your on your football cleats. Right. And now someone from Nike came to you and asked you to write a book. And it came out about a year ago, I believe. Well, well this wasn't so much a, a, a book. It was my idea to do the book. But the thing is, uh, this gentleman by the name of Nelson Ferris, uh, working with Phil Knight in the early days with a guy named Bill Bowerman, head track coach in Oregon. They wanted to introduce Nike into football. So they saw this young 19-year-old kid from San Fernando, California. And this guy by the name Nelson Ferris started studying my, my running style after the Notre Dame game where I had six touchdowns. That's what Nike needs. They were out of a box company and they still are. And he pursued me for the next two years to wear the shoe and the school wouldn't let me wear the shoe. 
And the one they finally decided to let me wear the shoe, it was uh, UCLA 1974, second quarter of the game. I break OJ Simpson's career rushing record in the shoe. And the shoe was painted black. It was made out of a waffle machine, urethane, out of a waffle machine. And, he, and he, he, he studied my running style. And he had these two pair of shoes he came to me after they decided to let me wear them. He painted them black and had the little white swoosh. And, and on the Sports Illustrated cover that, that, that eventually came on a game later, you see that shoe. And if you'd have told me 30 something years ago that, that, that I would be the first guy to wear the shoe on the, on the cover of Sports Illustrated, I thought she'd tell you you're nuts. And then I went on in the collegiate game play. So I'm the first collegiate and professional athlete to wear Nike and the first Nike athlete to grace the cover of Sports Illustrated. And they must have just been a mom and pop kind of shop at that time, right? Oh, well, they, not, nobody, well, really. Phil, <laughs> Phil Knight and Bill Bowerman literally used to give them away at the track. And see, the guy, the, the, the initial fourth uh, pioneer of the company was Steve Prefontaine. He was track. Football was Anthony Davis. Basketball was George Gervin. And, and tennis was beyond board. So they need to get these key athletes to introduce their, their line against the big boys like Adidas, Puma, and Rydell. That's who they were competing against. And so, so they were out of the box. They were considered a rebel, renegade company trying to snatch all these athletes away from them. And I happened to be one of those guys. But I was so enthused that this guy, Nelson Ferris, designed this shoe around my running style. And they thought this was a perfect thing for Nike, out of the box. And it's still that way. That's why, that's why I'm so glad to be associated with uh, this worldwide biggest shoe and apparel company in the world. And you, know, you actually wrote a biography about your life called If My Nikes Can Talk? Yes, I did. And, and, uh, and tell us about that. What was your initial emotion that you felt when they asked well, you to write about your life? First of all, when I when I, when they approached me to do the book, I said, you know, nobody wants to hear my story. Why? Why would you well, say that? Because you know, I, I didn't really think it was anything to it. I mean, there has been so many sports books written. But when I started thinking about my association with Nike, when I started thinking about the people involved in my life, Coach McKay, Rod Dato, Phil Knight, Nelson Ferris, and how my mother raised me, and some people like Willie Mays, who was my idol. And I said, you know something? Why not? And then, you know, it all started coming together, and I, said, and I got really enthused, and that's why I did it. So it's a, it's a real story behind it. You know what I love about that, too, Anthony, is that there's this, this I think of the scripture in the Bible, it says that all things work together for good. You know, everything in our life, the good, the bad, and, you know, even just, talking about the parallel of if my Nikes could talk, if those shoes could tell me where you've been, you know? But all that matters. We think about that. It all matters. The good, the bad. How are all the things have they, do you see looking back over your life how everything has worked together for good, even the bad things? Everything. I mean, there's a reason things happen. And as we speak, things are developing without ever knowing even your life, my life, and anyone's out here on the set's life. That when everything's happening, there's a reason why it happens. Yes. There's, there's always a purpose of what goes on in your life, regardless if you think what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen down the road. It's always being formulated. I mean, spiritually, everything's being formulated down the road. What's going to happen to you, all of us individually? Yeah, it's our, our steps are ordered for us. That's it. There's, there's, there's steps out there. There's a path for us. And we don't know where that path is, but every time when we step in that path, we got to be ready for the challenge. Yeah. And that's, that's what we all are. I mean, a lot of people would look at me and think I've had this privileged life and had a great you know, collegiate and going on the professional ball and stuff like that. But we all have a purpose in this life. And we all are special people. And uh, like they say, we're all God's children. 